Hey everybody, welcome today to the Green Room Video Cast. Today we have with us Shane Reed. Shane Reed. Mm -hmm. And we're discussing the Lincoln Hypothesis. Okay, I, I'm not an expert or anything, just a big avid fan of this book. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. So, um, so I invited Shane here today because he actually read the book and found it, found it really fascinating and really good. And so we thought it'd be great to share with you guys. Um, and so, Shane, tell me a little bit about this book. Give me a quick overview. Okay. Or the synopsis well, as well. <laughs> sure, sure. First of all, the author of the book is Timothy Ballard, and he, we could have a book about him. And I don't think he intentionally did it. He just kind of, by you know, briefly outlining what he does for a living, you're drawn into uh, his, what he does, and he has instant credibility. And what he is, and you know, basically the book's about Lincoln and how there's a, you know, a hypothesis or a theory that he was moved by the Spirit to do the things he did, and that there was a specific reason for um, you know, freeing the slaves and enacting the 13th and 14th Amendments because they applied to our freedom of religion. And to go into a little bit of background of uh, Timothy Ballard, he is currently the CEO of a, of a company called Operation Underground Rescue Railroad, where he frees sex slaves in uh, third world countries, primarily down in Central and South America. And um, I've seen him featured on Glenn Beck a couple of times, and he's become kind of a rock star that way. But he'll actually pretend like he's a, you know, a buyer of these services, of these 13, 12, you know, nine-year-old girls primarily. Uh, primarily in Central America and in, in Mexico. And he'll set up a big bus, he'll pay a big amount of money to, um, to pick up these kids and act like he's going to take them to some rich clients and then the slave traders never see these girls ever again and then they're arrested the next day. He you know, said so there's one particular part that's pretty touching at the beginning of the book where he kind of outlines what he does. Where he's, uh, he's you know, they pound him down to the ground because he has to act like he's being arrested as well. And he says he loves to look out of the corner of his eye and watch um, the rest of them getting taken down and watching the, the little kids. A lot of them don't, they still think he's the bad guy, seeing them all be freed. And so that's what really drives him. So, so he's talking about, of course, the great emancipator. Well, he is, yet, he is also an emancipator, you know, an emancipator of these children in these third world countries. So that's particularly... Uh, that is cool that you know he's the guy I did that, not know yeah, that. <laughs> yeah and so you know being an emancipator he's always been drawn to Lincoln and um, started noting these interesting coincidences um, and had you know started just delving into them all and one of the interesting things I didn't realize that was pointed out in this book is that when I don't know if this is still the case because I haven't seen it I haven't noted it in the recent inaugurations but uh, Washington and Lincoln in particular and a number of the early presidents not only placed their hands on the Bible but placed their hands in the Bible on their favorite scripture and you know one of our, our claims as a religion is that you know we have this rock star again I'll use the term named Joseph the guy with the multicolored coat right the one that was you know sold, sold into slavery again kind of a common mm -hmm. theme today by his brothers um, <clears throat> And how he is given all these amazing blessings, right? He's, Abraham blesses him and his two children, Ishmael, uh, not Ishmael, I'm sorry, um, Manasseh and Ephraim, that they would inherit this land of the everlasting hills, which we interpret to mean the Americas, you know. And yet then he then disappears, right? Pretty much his, his uh, descendants all kind of disappear. And then we have the rest of the book is really about the rest of the tribe, primarily Judah's descendants, right? And we, we make a claim that the Book of Mormon it picks up that awesome history of the descendants, the religious history of his, and that, that we get to see the fulfillment of his blessings that were pronounced upon his head and his two sons. And um, so we have a scripture chase, scripture that we all like to quote, right? That, uh, what is that? It goes, that Joseph is a fruitful bough, even a fruitful bough by a well, whose branches run over the wall, and we've been told that the wall meant the ocean back in those days, or that's supposed to be a reasonable interpretation of that. That he would, uh, you know, inherit this land of uh, everlasting hills. Mm -hmm. Well, um, that's found in Genesis 
49, 22 through 26, and also De Deuteronomy 33, 13 through 17. That's where Lincoln put his hand, is on that oh, scripture. Oh, really? Yeah. When he put his hand inside the Bible. Can you, can you repeat that scripture again for us? Yeah. That is uh, Genesis 49, 22 through 26, and Deuteronomy 33, 13 through 13. And those are the exact scriptures that Lincoln put his hands on. When that's he, what he put his hand on. Yeah, isn't that, that is, interesting? Is very interesting. Yeah, so it, you know, that's uh, one of the things that you know stuck out for Timothy Ballard as he's starting to, I think, be kind of led down this trail, almost like an investigator. Yeah. Because uh, a lot of times his job involves investigating before he can free the the, mm -hmm. the, the kids. Um, he has to figure out who's doing it, where they are, kind of intermingle intermingle with them, and mm -hmm. and enmesh himself in that gross society so that he can then free them. So he uses his investigative skills to kind of go down this path that it was primed by a lot of these kind of interesting coincidences. What kind of effort do you think it took Timothy to go and get all this information? Yeah, and he talks about how he actually went to a lot of these locations, these historical locations, and actually walked out in the fields and did a lot of hands-on. You know, nowadays we can kind of almost virtually go anywhere on the internet and actually yeah. use Google Earth and see these places. We actually physically still did it the old fashioned way where we went and stood in the fields. So we could actually feel what the what the humidity is like there and everything else. Now another thing is so he goes into the fact that in the Library of Congress, uh, and he has a, a great picture here on one of page one oh seven, mm -hmm. um, that before um, he wrote the Emancipation Proclamation, so between November 1861 and July 1862, I hope I have my dates right. <laughs> I, I didn't come too prepared on the dates, but um, he checked out the Book of Mormon. Mm -hmm. And it's listed right here in the Library of Congress that Lincoln, President U.S., A. Lincoln, comma, President U.S., checked out a number of books on that date. He checked out uh, Hyde's Mormonism, Book of Mormon, and right underneath the Book of Mormon is the U.S. Constitution. <laughs> oh, that is cool. So he's kind of like on a, some sort of, uh, he also has a Victor Hugo book in there. I really like Victor Hugo. And so he's kind of checked out all of these, uh, there's a couple other books on, on Mormonism, the Latter-day Saints. That's... So it, it looks like in Mormonism in all ages. But in particular, he has the Book of Mormon for, what is that, um, November, December. It's about nine months he kept the book. That's and there's a lot of, uh, I think if they were to do some sort of, and I don't, Mr. Ballard didn't go into this, this, into this detail, mm -hmm. but probably do some sort of analysis, but he did allude to a lot of language similarities between some of the things that Lincoln wrote later. He seemed to have a different view of uh, America as the promised land and mm -hmm. things. And that's just another one of the interesting things that... Uh, uh, there's also another awesome scripture. I believe it's one of the Ezekiel scripture chases. Um, it might be the, you know, establishment in the latter days of the Zion and the everlasting hills or whatever. I think it's that one in Ezekiel. I, I'm sorry, I didn't come better prepared, but um, that's the the scripture that Washington had his hand on. <laughs> oh, really? So Washington and Lincoln both had their hands on scripture chase scriptures when they were inaugurated to be presidents of the United <laughs> States. So yeah, and then you start looking at. Well, the, the religious ramifications of the 14th Amendment. Mm -hmm. Now, um, So can you write us yeah. again what the 14th, if you yeah. remember what the 14th Amendment is for those yeah. people that don't know? Because I'm one of those people that, you yeah. know, you go through all that and you don't remember. Yeah. Well, the book points out that the Emancipation Proclamation itself didn't free the slaves, mm -hmm. but it was the starting point. Then there was the 13th Amendment, which really did free the slaves. Mm -hmm. Then you had the 14th Am Amendment, which applied that to the states because when we all first started as a nation, you know, we had the flag with the 13 stars, and we had 13 colonies, we all had a very guarded and jealous states or colonies, right? Mm -hmm. they, they wanted to um, maintain their autonomy and they were threatened by this, this let's all get together thing and make this a federal, we're all going to be one block. So they, there was a lot of negotiating between the colonies as to um, you know what we're giving up by doing this and they didn't want to give up much they wanted to retain most of their autonomy their self-control they said look you know we'll give a little bit of power to the federal government to raise an army mm -hmm. that kind of stuff but for the most part we're gonna stay um, 
individual. We're going to control what's in our borders, and, and we don't want you messing around with anything. <laughs> you know, you had the little tiny guy like uh, Rhode Island, and you had the big wealthy uh, Commonwealth of Virginia. These, uh, these states were wrestling for, for control. And so what ended up happening is a thing they call federalism. Mm -hmm. It's like the first thing, I went to BYU Law School, and the first thing we studied was federalism. Mm -hmm. well, and same with political science over at SOU. You know, like that. The first thing we talked about the first week was this federalism, because it over, it, it cloaks everything. Mm -hmm. it, it, is, it was something they had to wrestle with, overcome, fiddle with, manipulate. During the whole course of our history, we're still wrestling with it to this day. Mm -hmm. And so, what happened was when you had, it wasn't Boggs initially, it was the one before Boggs in, in Missouri mm -hmm. that was issuing these orders against the, the Mormons, right? And remember when uh, Joseph and a couple of the brethren went to, not Van Buren, but I think his predecessor, I'm forgetting the, the names, but he, he said, please help us out. Do you think this is right? I mean, how, mm -hmm. how can you allow this to happen? And uh, something similar to what uh, Van Buren, I think, later on said was, I can see your cause, I see your plight, but there's nothing I can do about it. And what he was admitting is that the way the Constitution was written, it was to protect us from the federal government, mm -hmm. but it didn't apply to the states. And so when we did the Emancipation Proclamation, we, <laughs> our country did, Lincoln, that then paved the way for the 13th and 14th Amendments. The 14th Amendment said, we're going to apply the Constitution to the states now. Mm -hmm. And so now, if Joseph Smith had gone to the president after the 14th Amendment, oh. the president could have done something about it. Could he say, yeah. you can't uh, interfere with somebody's religion that's against the Constitution, and so the federal government could have done something about it. So not only did it free the slaves, but it also freed us as a, as a religion and any other religion that was starting. Many other religions were starting at that time. I think the Jehovah's Witnesses started during that time, the mm -hmm. Seventh-day Adventists. There was a you know, reawakening a lot uh, during that period of time. But they all of a sudden had a religious protection that they didn't normally have, mm -hmm. just as the, the individual states could have slaves, mm -hmm. in spite of the fact that the Constitution starts, you know, we're all created equal and everything. You had some people owning other people. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's kind of the interesting point of the whole book, and really, I, I really recommend it. It's really fascinating how mm -hmm. he's able to collect all this information and able to connect it with um, with the Church of Jesus Christ today. Yeah. Yeah, yeah he talks about the, the, the terrible curse that we had upon us mm -hmm. uh, of, of slavery, and that that uh, needed to be eradicated and, and, uh, and resolved for us to move forward as a nation. And that, you know, obviously the sacrifice of uh, hundreds of thousands, right, I believe, died in the Civil War. Mm -hmm. And uh, he really makes a strong case for that being such a blight on our, on our country that until we purged that from us, uh, we, we would not fulfill this destiny of being the, the chosen land, the everlasting hills. That, that was mm -hmm. an impediment to us. We couldn't move any further. Yeah, very so, convincingly. I think it's interesting how the Lord, uh, I guess, you know, the Civil War did have to happen in order for his work to move forward. Yeah, and remember Joseph Smith prophesied that it would happen, right? Saying mm -hmm. if this doesn't happen, the South will rise up. I mean, it's in the Doctrine and Covenants, just as another proof that Joseph Smith really was truly a prophet, that he foresaw that, you know. And uh, I'm sure he was, one of the purposes that he was hoping to fulfill was to avoid all that bloodshed that he probably saw mm -hmm. that ended up having to happen anyway. But, so why would you recommend this book to our viewers? It, it opened up my mind completely on, on, because I was a bit of a conservative politically, almost had a little bit of a, an edge about my opinion towards Lincoln. How much I do think he's a wonderful, one of the greatest presidents we ever had, etc. But I, I see that they have now, the pendulum has swung so much that the federal government has you know, uh, intervened and uh, uh, usurped so much of the autonomy that the states used to have that it's almost gone the other way, right? Mm -hmm. But we needed it as a church and uh, to free the slaves. Now the pendulum's gone the other way. So people have a tendency to look back on that and say, oh man, if that weren't for that dang 14th Amendment, you know, we, we wouldn't have to wrestle with all these issues and have the federal government tell us about Common Core and all these <laughs> things that, you know, a lot of people don't, don't agree with these, these it's, you know, 
intervention of the federal government in every aspect of our lives. Now, we kind of like that idea of let's have Rogue River or, or Medford control our own school district. Why is somebody in Washington, D.C. telling us? You know, that's the, that gives rise to all that. But all of a sudden made me look the other way and go, well, we needed that. Mm -hmm. you know, it's not Lincoln's fault that it went this far, <laughs> but we, we needed that at the time. Thank you, everybody, for coming today to the video cast. I want to thank Shane for coming in and talking to us today about the Lincoln Hypothesis. And you guys can pick it up today at the Green Room for $22.99 down here. So thank you so much, Shane. Thank you very much. Hey, everyone. Thanks for watching today. If you like what you saw, please subscribe below. Also, anything talked about in today's video can be purchased down at Southern Oregon's only LDS bookstore, the Green Room. All right, we'll see you next time.